Amen. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thanks, Becky. <laughs> we're so glad you're here, and we're so glad for your kids. Uh, fantastic. See all those kids headed out to Kids Zone. Uh, so glad for Kids Zone, which systematically teaches kids the Bible as they meet the Lord in His Word. If you have your Bibles with you and you'd like to open them with me, I'll be in Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5 today. Uh, would you turn to your neighbor and say true or false? So go ahead, turn to your neighbor and say true or false. All right, so we're going to do this quote, and at the end of it, I'd like you to turn to your neighbor and say true or false. So, yeah, at the end of it. James C. Fisher, in A Few Buttons Missing, The Casebook of a Psychiatrist. So this is this guy's biography, autobiography, and um, he was a practicing psychiatrist. He wrote this. If you were to take the sum total of all authoritative articles ever written. So why authoritative articles? Because articles are the cutting, cutting edge of the science. Not books, because books are too slow, but articles are much faster, so articles because it's on the cutting edge. So if you're going to take the sum total of all authoritative articles ever written by the most qualified psychology, psych, psychologists and psychiatrists on the subject of mental health or mental hygiene. So you got it? We're going to take the sum total of all the authoritative articles ever written, the cutting edge of all the sciences, by the people that know the most about mental health or mental hygiene. And if you were to combine them, put them all together, in, in, when, we were, when, our, when the boys were little, we used to play a game called Superhero Powers. And what you would want to do is we'd go around and we'd take turns picking which superhero powers we would want so if you're, we made Superman illegal, because if you got Superman's powers, you just could beat everyone and it wasn't fair. But you might want Flash's speed, or you might want Captain America's shield, or you might want Batman's brains, you know, so superhero powers is where you combine stuff. Like, what if you were to combine superhero powers, all the knowledge, in all these authoritative articles? You got it? And refine them and cleave out the excess verbiage. If you were to take the whole of the meat and none of the parsley, so you are to combine all the best of all the information and get it nice and clean and get it beautiful. And if you were to have these unadulterated bits of pure scientific knowledge concisely expressed by the most capable of living poets, you getting the picture? All the best knowledge, cleaned up, combined, made beautiful, you would have an awkward and incomplete summary of the Matthew chapter 5 through Matthew chapter 7, Sermon on the Mount. He's not done. He's got one more sentence. And, he says, it would suffer immeasurably by comparison. So you'd place this, all this knowledge and, and, and beautify it and combine it and make it all that, and you'd put it next to the Sermon on the Mount, and that would look really sad and poor and pathetic and incomplete and shabby compared to the Sermon on the Mount. True or false? There's part of you that wonders, though, isn't there? Part of you that goes, I don't know. I think when our culture is looking for guidance to life, like, tell me how to live, Tell me about mental health. Tell me about mental hygiene. Tell me how to live great. I think our, our culture goes to talk shows. 
goes to podcasts, goes to social, different social media feeds, goes to different YouTube stars, goes to different authors. I don't know if our culture thinks Jesus. Now, why is that? I think it's because there's a word that we don't associate with Jesus very often. In fact, just between us, I don't know if you associate this word with Jesus very often. And that word is smart. I think you think Jesus would make a good sacrificial lamb, but I'm not sure if you'd want him to run your company. I think Jesus, you think, well, he'd be really nice and he, can, he has great superhero powers, you know, he can heal people, that's pretty cool, but I'm not sure you'd want him managing your portfolio. I'm not sure, I'm not sure you'd trust him to give you really solid life advice. But what if he is smart? I mean, what we believe, because you mean you believe this too, you believe he, he created all things. Like he made the system that the people that we think are smart try to study and try to understand. He, he stands behind it. He made all of it. He holds it all together. What I'm saying is he is smart, and what we've been seeing in Matthew chapter 5 is that he is for our flourishing. He is for our well-being. In a word, he is for our happiness. This is how we're translating the word blessed. So Jesus is for your happiness, but this happiness has terms, which he spells out in Matthew chapter 4. So in Matthew chapter 4, we read the summary statement of the Sermon on the Mount. If you're trying to look for one sentence to sum up the entire Sermon on the Mount, it would be this. From that time, Jesus began to preach, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If you look for the word kingdom of heaven, you'll see it all throughout Matthew's gospel, but especially in the Sermon on the Mount. And I think repentance is the shape of the Beatitudes. And that's what I've been trying to show week after week of how each beatitude is another step in this step of repentance. See, Jesus wanting you to repent is not different than him wanting you to be happy. Just like, just like if, if you had kids, you would want them to be happy. I know you would. Like if you had kids, you would want them to be happy, right? And I know, I know you, you're like, would not. And say, yes, of course I'd want my kids to be happy. But that doesn't mean you're going to pat them on the head and tell them, they're doing everything right all the time. Especially once you have kids and you see that they're little sinners and they need to be corrected and they need to repent. Happiness is not different than desiring them to change. Happiness is saying, because I'm for you, I'm imploring you to change. So Jesus, because he wills our good, is imploring us to change. And this is that process that we're seeing in the Beatitudes. So have in your mind, up front, gonna kind of, just kind of reintroduce this idea, which we really started with in week one. Jesus is for our flourishing, and because he is for our well-being, our happiness, or our flourishing, he is imploring us, he is pleading with us to repent. And he's spelling out the process here in the Beatitudes. So we are on this week, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. So this week we're going to talk about what it means to show mercy, and then why we should show mercy. So if you're taking notes for your camp scholarship, you, we're going to talk about what mercy is, so like how to show mercy, then we'll get even more specific, number two, then we'll say, well, why should you show mercy? So why will be number three, more specific will be number two, and give me a big, broad definition will be number one. Okay? So that's the plan. So let's talk about how to show mercy. So one time, Jesus 
is talking, and there's this guy that wants to show that he is smarter than Jesus. And he's a lawyer, and so he's pretty sure he's pretty smart, and he's pretty sure he's smarter than Jesus. So he raises his hand, says, Jesus, I've got a question. And Jesus calls on him, and he tries to show Jesus up. And of course, this doesn't go great for him. So trying to justify himself, he asks Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Because he asks him, how do I inherit eternal life? It's a million-dollar question. Jesus says, um, love, God, you know, the, the, the PowerPoint just came and went, and so I kind of lost my train of thought. But did it come and go up here, or was it just back there? Both? Okay. We're working on fixing that, just so you know. So we're talking about showing mercy, and we're talking about what is it. And we say that the lawyer came to have a showdown with Jesus and see who was smarter. And so they ask a question about eternal life. Love God, love neighbor, turns out, is the command. So he says, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells him a story to talk about that. So let's look at that story in Luke chapter 10, and this will tell us about mercy. So here we go. A man was going down from from Jerusalem to Jericho. So Jerusalem is really high. He's literally going, traveling downhill, windy, road, Jesus tells this story. And he fell among bad guys, robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, okay, did he see him? Yeah, he did. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So he saw him, and what did he do? Passed by, nothing. Yeah, kept scrolling on his phone as he walked by. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place, saw him. Did he see him? Yep. What did he do? He kept scrolling on his phone. Passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, remember, I mean, Samaritan then would have been like Palestinian today. Like a lot of animosity there. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. Now watch this, because this is mercy. He had compassion. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. And whatever you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Now, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. Mercy. So, here's a really scientific definition of mercy. Really complicated. You're really going to have to work at understanding this. Got to know Greek, kind of, to understand this. What does it mean to show people mercy? Mercy. Well, the Greek word is to help them. I'm kidding. It just means to help them. Just help them. Just see them and take action. Just see them, have compassion, and take action. See, seeing them is, and feeling bad for them is like, okay, you started on the process, but actually helping them is what makes the difference. Just feeling bad for them can be self-exalting. Just feeling bad for them might make you feel better about yourself, but it really doesn't do anything for them. Because you might look at them and say, oh, they're in such a bad spot, and be saying at the same time, but I'm in such a good spot. You might look at them and say, boy, they've really made a mess of their lives. I really feel bad for them. But then also be thinking, well, I've really kept my life pretty clean and pretty good. And that's not mercy. That's not helping them. What Jesus, the story Jesus told about mercy is when you stop and you get down into the mess with them and you help them. So, what about at your house? A lot of wives are overextended Overcommitted, exhausted. Husbands, let's say you notice that your wife 
is overcommitted, overextended, utterly exhausted. What will you do? Will you keep scrolling? Or will you decide you, it's better just to play the my life is harder than yours game and say, well, my day started at this time and I had to do all these hard things today and try to like show how your day was longer and harder than her life because you're more overcommitted and overextended and over this and over that than she is anyway. So you don't have to show mercy. Is that showing mercy? Parents, it's like when you see that your kid is frustrated and sad and something's bothering them and they're spending tons of time in their room, what will you do? You see it. What will you do? Will you you keep scrolling because there's lots of important news stories you've only seen 10 times today and you need to see the 11th time? What will you do? Will you say, oh, well, you know, all teenagers that go through that stuff and just turn the TV back on? Do they really need a lecture about how hard you had to work when you were a kid and how easy they have it? That mercy? Students, what would it be like to see you know, Jesus told the story about a Samaritan getting beat up by robbers, and there he is, stripped, beaten, bloody, broken, half dead on the side of the road. Students, what does that look like in the hallway at school? And I have to think part of the hallway at school is Snapchat. Like, what does that look like on social media? And what will you do? Will you see it and think, oh, I'm glad that's not me. I better keep moving because the robbers are still around here. The safe things to do is to just not notice and keep moving. What will you do? This is not hard to understand, mercy. But it's sure costly to practice. Mercy. Mercy. Jesus says, I'm for your blessing. I'm for your flourishing. So we're to the point now where he says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Will you be merciful? So number one, mercy is helping. Number two, let's get more specific. So when we get more specific, if you have your Bibles open, which I'd really encourage you, if you don't carry a Bible, we have uh, Bibles on a cart in the back, and you're, there's always Bibles there for you to take for free. If you don't have one, or if you forgot one, really like you to be able to see it, and um, because it'll just help you see how the flow of the passage when, you, when you're looking at it in context. So, so here we are in Matthew chapter 5, which you'll see is the Beatitudes. That's like the doorway to the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus is saying, come on in. Come on in, come on in to the kingdom. It's great in here, but repent on your way in. Got to repent. And so that is blessed, and that is the Beatitudes. Then you'll see a heading that says salt and light, where Jesus says, if you do this, you are going to be really, really different. You'll be as different from, you'll be different like salt is different than meat. You'll be different like light is different from darkness. If you repent like this, you will be different. Different. You'll be different than the religious people because your righteousness will be better and stronger and different than that of the scribes and the Pharisees. And then he gives six examples of what it will be like for you to be different and how your righteousness will be more complete and better. Righteousness being right with Godness. Then he says in chapter chapter six we go to life goals, and I'm just kind of naming some of the uh, sermon series that are coming up. But he talks about life goals here. And now, and one of the things he really makes clear is, this is not image management. We just impress everyone with how righteous you are. This is about you getting alone with God. And practicing your righteousness there, and God seeing it and rewarding you. Then he talks about other life goals you might have, where you might be in like trying to store up lots of treasures here on earth. You might be worried about losing your treasures that you have stored up here on earth. 
And he says this as life goals, to kind of bring all the life goals together. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, he says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these other things will be added unto you. This is your life goal. Seek first God and his kingdom. Seek first his righteousness. That is the main life goal. Remember we're talking about how to show mercy? I'm just kind of trying to set the table for you with the Sermon on the Mount. So after you decide, I'm going to seek first God and his righteousness, the first thing most people want to do is change the person sitting next to them because after all, they are the problem. I mean, that's true in your marriage, right? You're not the problem. They are the problem. That's true with you and your kids, right? You're not the problem. Those stinking kids are the problem. That's true, right? It's not you that's the problem. It's your parents that are the problem. So what does Jesus say? Well, first... Before you try to take the speck out of their eye, take the log out of your own eye. And when you find this really, really hard, ask the Father for help, because he would love to help. And then it all comes down to Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Like it all comes down to this. This is the righteousness that is greater than the scribes and the Pharisees. This is the righteousness that you're hungering and thirsting for in Matthew chapter 5, verse 5. This is the righteousness in part that you would be persecuted for at the end of the Beatitudes. This is the righteousness that it all comes back to because this is where the law and the prophets meet. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Not hard to understand, really hard to do. So think about this. We said mercy is helping. It is helping people, not just feeling bad for people, helping people. Then we said, husbands, will you do this? Or will you just keep trying to justify yourself and keep telling yourself how busy you are and keep saying you don't have the margin? Will you do this? So here's how you do it. You'd say, well, if I was her and I was overextended and overcommitted and exhausted, what would, what would I want? I've got an idea. Maybe, maybe she'd want to hear thank you. Just say thank you sometimes. That might be an act of mercy. Just saying, I appreciate everything you're doing. And list specific things that she's doing. Be specific. It might be like not being asked, but just emptying the dishwasher quietly and loading the dishwasher quietly. That might be a terrific act of mercy. I was talking about pitching that idea to a friend, and he shouts back at me, Well, wait, wait, wait! There's a lot of husbands that get criticized for doing that wrong. <laughs> Loading the dishwasher is really scientifically hard stuff. Well, there might be other issues to talk about in the marriage. <laughs> Parents, I mean, if you see your kids are struggling... And you have decided, like based on the parable of the Good Samaritan, that just passing by, just continuing to scroll, just pretending it's not a problem, that that's no longer an option. But like you got to wade in. How could you wade in? Well, one, one idea might be, how would you want someone else to wade into your life? Would it be as you're on your way out the door in the morning because you're in a hurry, you're running kind of late, on the way out the door, shout at you, hey, you're screwed up. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> Can they just, like, or would it be like, hey, could we have some unphoned time and sit down over a nice meal with unphoned time and say, so how are things really going? And just have unhurried time to talk. 
Would you like that better or would you like something else better? But ask, okay, I'm going to do unto others as I would have them do unto me. How would I want someone to approach me? I'll try to approach them in that same way, understanding them the best I can. And students, like in the hallway, the jungle at school, where kids are left bloody and broken on the hallway, how would you want someone to respond to you if they saw you bloody and broken in the hallway? This is the question Jesus teaches us to ask. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. So what we said is Jesus is for our flourishing, and so he commands us to repent. Part of the repentance is showing mercy. And so how do we show mercy? Well, we see a need, and then we have compassion, and we do our best to meet that need. So that is helping. And so how do we help? Well, we help by thinking about Matthew chapter 7, verse 12, and we try to think, okay, if I was them, how would I want to be helped? Understanding them the best we can, using all of our empathy powers, how could I help them? Now, why should we do this? Why should we do this? I'll give you a second to write that down. Why should we do this? Well, because Jesus um, has taught us to. And I, I want you to see the blessing that the Beatitudes don't start with, blessed are the righteous, because none of us would make it. The Beatitudes don't start with, blessed are the pure, because none of us would make it. The Beatitudes don't start with, blessed are even the merciful, because none of us are merciful like this by nature. The Beatitudes start with, blessed are the poor in spirit. Because this is where repentance starts. Repentance starts with, I can't do this. Repentance starts with, I am spiritually bankrupt. Re the Beatitude starts, repentance starts with, I have tried and tried and tried and tried, and I can't do this. I can't. I shouldn't even be here. I don't know what I'm doing. This is ridiculous. I give up. When you're there, you are poor in spirit. If you're not there yet, then maybe you need to try a little harder and fail a few more times, and then you'll be there. Repentance starts with being poor in spirit, saying, I can't do this. As we get at, used to the idea, we can't do this. We're ready to start mourning our sin. So as we, as we say, I'm poor in spirit, I can't do this, I start thinking about all the times I've sinned, all the times I've failed, specific times I've sinned, specific times I've failed. And I start listing them, and I start thinking about the consequences of those sins. The consequences for me, the consequences for you, how it grieves the heart of God, how Jesus was nailed to the cross for my sins. Like I started thinking about all the terrific consequences of my sin and I mourn my sin and I hate my sin and I feel itchy with guilt and I feel like this is so, I'm so embarrassed, I'm so ashamed, I hate this. Blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. And so we confess our sins and he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Because of Jesus shed blood on our behalf. So I start with being poor in spirit. Then I mourn my sin, and Jesus forgives my sin, and I am comforted. Then I say, you know what? I'm going to stop selfishly grasping. I'm going to stop selfishly taking. I'm going to stop trying to control everything and everyone. I'm going to stop trying to make life go my way. And I'm going to start praying, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. I'm going to stop trying to make God meet my terms and give him complete rights to my life and live life on his terms. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. I trust God to have complete control of my life 
to take all my strength and make it his. As I do this, I, I'm still at the end of myself, and I pray, God, I need to be righteous. Would you give me your righteousness? I want to be right with you. Please make me right with you. And God is merciful and makes us right with him. As we hunger and thirst after righteousness, he gives us his righteousness, and we are satisfied. Do you see how there's been mercy every step of the way? We were poor we had nothing, and he met us with his mercy. We were mourning our sin, and he met us with his mercy. We were at the end of ourselves. We, had, we give up trying to do things in our own strength, and he meets us with his mercy, and so we become meek. We don't have any righteousness of our own, so we hunger and thirst after it, and he gives us his righteousness, and that is his mercy. Do you see that? And now, because we've received all of his mercy. Now we're ready to be merciful. And as we're ready to become merciful people, now we're ready to be meek and stop selfishly grabbing and taking. So, mercy, it turns out, is good fruit. So as Jesus is summing up the Sermon on the Mount and bringing it together and telling people they really need to pick, he ends it with several different statements about you really need to decide. You need to decide which gate you're going to pass through. You need to decide which road you're going to take. You need to decide what kind of tree you are, whether you bear good fruit or bad fruit. You need to decide what kind of builder you are and what kind of house you're going to build. He really kind of brings people to a point of decision. And he says this in Matthew chapter 19 as he's doing that. He says, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. It'd be pastoral malpractice for me to not say, mercy is good fruit. And if you are not merciful, then you need to really reckon with what it means that every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Mercy is good fruit. So if you can look at your overcommitted, overextended, overworked, exhausted wife and be like, I don't care. Be afraid. If you can look at your kids and be like, Every kid struggles. Who cares? Be afraid. If you can look at people broken and bleeding in the hallway and be like, well, I'm glad that's not me. That's not good fruit. So what should we do? We should do what the disciples have always done. Matthew chapter 5, verse 1. Seeing the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. Go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. He will give you mercy. And as he gives you mercy, you'll be able to give it to others. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your mercy. We thank you that you give it to us and that you enable us to give it to others. Keep us close to you. Keep giving us mercy. Even when we're arrogant, even when we're proud, even when we are self-willed, be merciful to us. Call us back to yourself. Get our attention. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.